No, it's an image of the breast. What is it an image of? It's an energy spectrum. And the new, con it's interesting, medicine doesn't recognize the role of energy, but uses all the new quantum physics devices derived to read energy. So PET scans, CAT scans, EMI, you know, the MRIs, excuse me, all those kinds of technologies work on what? Reading the energy. So the relevance is this. They understand that the CAT scan will pick out the tissue there in the center where a cancer is. Well, why do I know that that's a cancer tissue? And the answer is, the energy emitted by those cells is different than all the other energy. So when I do an energy scan, I can start to see which the character of the cells by the energy they are re emitting. Well, what's the relevance? And the answer is this. Conventional medicine would then see this and say, well, then what I have to do is go inside there physically, cut out that bad tissue and remove the bad tissue, only using the energy process for diagnostics. But the bottom line is this, as we showed in the slide about atoms, not only do they emit energy, but they absorb energy. So the interesting part is, rather than physically going in there, it is then possible to put the energy back in to adjust the energy of the cells rather than to destroy the cells. And so the fact is, in the process of healing, healing energies, and we've heard about it for a long time, people emit energies, and that these energies influence the cells. And so the reality is that whether medicine wants to own it or not, physics automatically says you cannot deny the reality that physical matter radiates energy and absorbs energy, and by absorbing energy, I can change the structure of the matter. So the fact is, it's better in a longer understanding and a far better way off for all of us, rather than getting in our bodies and cutting it open and cutting pieces out, to understand by redirecting the energy back into the body, you can entrain cells that are not at the right energy to adapt and adopt the right energy and therefore do healing without cutting out the tissue itself. Well, how can that work? How can I send energy in and affect matter? Well, most of you have seen or heard about somebody like Ella Fitzgerald, uh, a vocalist who can sing a certain note, and at, a cer at that certain time when that note is heard, a crystal goblet will explode. Uh, people are familiar with the breaking glass with singing? How does it work? And it works like this. The crystal, the atoms, are all vibrating, just like I showed you. They're all spinning and they're vibrating, and they're vibrating at a certain frequency. So if I say that they're vibrating in here at a fr frequency X, all the atoms, even though they're all in structure making the shape of the crystal goblet, they're connected to each other by uh, atomic bonds, but they're each individually vibrating where they are, like this. They're all hanging, but they still maintain the structure. Now I take a tuning fork, and it's tuned to the same frequency that the atoms are. And when I hit that tuning fork, the energy of the tuning fork radiates out. And if the atoms are complementary, harmonically resonant, that's the word, complementary, harmonically resonant with the tuning fork, then the atoms will absorb the energy, just like it said in that paper. All atoms emit and absorb energy. So if I tune the energy of the tuning fork to match the energy of the atoms, remember the atoms are just like this, but what happens if the tuning fork gives them extra energy and they absorb it? What happens to their movement? It goes faster and faster and boom! The point is, what happens is, the tuning fork causes the goblet not to break. In reality, if you see a photograph of it, the, tuning, the goblet doesn't break, the goblet explodes. Why? Because all the atoms are vibrating now with so much extra energy, they can't hold on to each other, and then the structure is completely gone. So this is a reality, that energy affects matter. And in fact, in medicine, they're actually using this in one process. Remember the you know, kidney stones that get in your, in your kidney? You have to pass them. That's the old way. What's the new way? Well, the kidney stones are crystals. And if they're crystals, the atoms vibrate at a certain frequency. So what the new procedure is, rather than passing the kidney stone, they put a probe up that broadcasts like a frequency, like a focused tuning fork, with the exact frequency of the kidney stone. And what happens to the kidney stone? The same thing that happens to the goblet. It explodes. And all of a sudden, you don't have to worry. Now all you've got to pass is a little sand, but not the whole rock along with it. So it's a lot easier in that process. But the question is, does this apply to biology? And the answer is, of course. And it works like this. Here's a tuning fork. There's a protein receptor with an antenna on it. The antenna vibrates at a certain frequency. Now, the antennas generally respond, as conventional medicine says, to molecules, which is true. 
because molecules have their own frequency, as it said in that slide, and when the molecule is present, if it vibrates at the same frequency as the receptor, then the receptor will vibrate when the molecule vibrates, and when the receptor vibrates, it will go from confirmation one to confirmation two as a result of responding to that vibrational energy. So the bottom line is what we expect is this. I hit the tuning fork, and then the, the receptor, which is in confirmation A, begins to absorb the energy, and then the result changes the shape of the protein, the structure of you know, the assembly of the, the, the backbone, how it's organized, changes that, and then the receptor goes to confirmation B or 2 at this particular case. So the point is this. The receptors, which remember what the function of the receptors are? They're the ones that signal the process. That the receptors not only respond to molecules, but the receptors respond to energy. Well, if they respond to energy, then why isn't it not, why is my medical doctor not talking about energy? Because I, as a medical professor, never taught them that in the first place. Why? Because when I was teaching medical doctors, that was not part of our understanding. And yet, I, since my research started to take me that way, I realized something, that there's been papers in the literature that have been in there for 50 or 100 years, over and over again, in the hard stream, main core scientific journals, Papers about what? Electromagnetic fields affecting every level of cell biology. The paper in the upper left, electromagnetic fields, the effect on DNA synthesis. There are certain electromagnetic fields that turn on DNA synthesis, other fields that shut it off. The one on the right, pulsing electromagnetic fields induce cellular transcription. That means RNA synthesis. So there are electromagnetic frequencies that turn on RNA synthesis and turn off RNA synthesis, the bottom one. Exposure of salivary gland cells to low-frequency electromagnetic fields alters polypeptide, protein synthesis. So what's the point? These are mainstream medical journals. What do they say? That the energy in the environment can activate all of the main functions of a cell, DNA synthesis, RNA synthesis, and protein synthesis. More than that, these papers also show, like the one in the upper left, that I can get blood vessels to differentiate, grow and form blood vessels by putting them in electromagnetic fields, just putting the cells in the fields. Or I can get mononuclear blood cells, the upper one on the right, to start to divide mitosis in the field. The electromagnetic fields can cause them to divide. Why is that relevant? When mononuclear cells start to divide out of control, that's called leukemia. So in other words, I can induce leukemia in an electromagnetic field by causing these cells to divide out of schedule. Uh, this one is very important here on the right. Noradrenaline release potentiated in a nerve cell line by low intensity pulse magnetic fields. And this is the new area that's getting a lot of attention. It's actually illustrated in the next slide as well. Electromagnetic fields, biological influences. Electromagnetic fields exert effects on and through hormones. What are the function of hormones? Regulation of the body. What does it now reveal? High tension lines, cell phones, microwaves, they all influence the hormones of the body and then throw the body out of alignment by being in the field. Now it says, well, how come literature says that, that the high tension lines don't affect people because that's what the story was? And the answer is that data was skewed and incorrect and they were required to do it again because there is an effect by electromagnetic fields on your biology. But here's the interesting little catch. If you are not under stress, the fields will not affect you. If you're under stress, you, the fields get very, very specific and can alter your biology. So the interesting thing, when they were doing the assays, nobody just detected the difference between stressed and non-stressed individuals. Now it reveals that stress is the primary mechanism that opens your body to the exposure and changing of its function by electromagnetic fields. And especially estrogen is one of the highest responding hormones in the body to electromagnetic fields. And that's relevant because estrogen is involved with cell proliferation and cancer so that there's a, a connection between the fields now. Now, the signals that come in, let's just stop, let's end at this moment on that other section. What does it say? It says that signals control the biology, that conventional medicine only, as it said in the science article, recognizes molecules as the source of the signals, but quantum physics, which is the parent science, and all science have to adopt to the quantum physics, so biology has to adopt the physics, and recognize what quantum physics says is that energy activates these receptors as well, 